Wall Street didn't build America. The middle, the middle class built America. And unions built the middle class. These deals are game changers. Not only for UAW workers, but for all workers in America. You helped everybody. And look, I, and I want to thank you for your commitment to, to the solidarity for exercising your right to bargain collectively. President Joe Biden sporting some fresh UAW merch as he celebrated the union's historic new contracts. He also met with UAW President Sean Fain and stressed support for unions after the weeks-long strike. The tentative deals guarantee auto workers their largest pay increases in decades and could affect how other unions bargain their future contracts. I spoke with United Auto Workers President Sean Fain all about his victory just before he met with the president. Watch this. Sean Fain, thank you so much for joining. I guess I should start with congratulations. How does it feel? You've got this deal almost over the line. It's, uh, you know, it's it's definitely, uh, you know, good feeling to be where we are right now, to be here today in Belvedere, Illinois, uh, you know, sharing such great news with uh, with workers here and, uh, you know, just seeing the whole community lifted up, you know, as a result of, of the work we've done and the work that our membership's done in, in uh, delivering a record contract. For decades, the U.S. has not had a labor-led economy, and we've suffered in this country. Does this deal signal a significant power shift between workers and executives? Yeah, I believe it does, and I, I believe it's time. It's long overdue. You know, for 40 years, we, we, the class warfare has been going on in this country. The billionaire class and the corporate class have been running away with all the profits, and the workers have been left behind. And, you know, I, I truly believe, uh, you know, Union or non-union, um, workers in this country are fed up with falling, with going backwards, and uh, you know, in, in the richest times in history of many of these companies. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that's why our our messaging has resonated so well, not just with our membership, but with the entire working class, you know, globally. And um, uh, you know, when 26 billionaires have as much wealth as half of humanity, we have a crisis, and it's time to turn that around. And I believe organized labor is the vehicle to make that happen. So we got to harness that power of the working class organized like hell and uh and uh and and we have the power last night the actors union and hollywood studios reached an agreement that would end the nearly four-month strike today tens of thousands of health care workers who went on strike they approved a new contract this year has been extremely active for unions yet the percentage of unionized workers has been falling last year was the lowest on record how can you reverse that trend um, I think we, we do what we've just done here. We bargain good contracts. We start setting san standards again. You know, the UAW in particular, when it was when it was founded in the 1930s, uh, you know, people saw a better way of life. They saw a difference. They saw standard, you know, uh, standards being set, and they saw a better way of life, and they wanted to be a part of that. And I believe, you know, with what we're doing now, people want to be a part of that. They, they, they want their share of economic justice for their work. And Without a union, that's a hard thing to do. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we've dealt with fear mongering in this country, uh, you know, for the last 40 years plus, where, you know, they try to make people afraid of joining unions and uh, companies, you know, pay firms to come in. They spend billions of dollars to try to discourage workers from wanting a union. And there's a reason they do that, because they don't want workers to have that power. But you know, we've seen um, when workers withhold their labor, nothing moves. And, and the COVID pandemic, I, I would tell anyone that if there was a silver lining in that, there was a great lesson there. You know, you look at the fast food industry, workers refused to go to work for $12 an hour and risk their lives. And what happened? You know, those fast food companies had to raise pay to $20 an hour and above to get people to come to work. And, uh, you know, that was a great example of what happens when working class people uh, withhold their labor. We have the power. We just have to utilize it. And I, I do believe that organized labor is the vehicle to make that happen. Do you believe that this new contract, these better terms from, for your workers that they needed, could em impact the price we pay for cars? Could it increase those prices? It, it doesn't have to at all. And again, that's the fear mongering coming from the corporate class and the wealthy. They want to they want workers to be discouraged from asking for their fair share. And the irony here is over the last four years, the price of vehicles went up 30 to 35 percent in this country on average. Uh, our wages went backwards. And so, you know, now that we bargain a good contract, all of a sudden you hear the, the, the battle cry that, oh, the price of vehicles are going to go up. The price of vehicles does not have to raise a penny, and these companies will still make billions of dollars. 
all this comes down to is it's corporate greed and it's consumer price gouging. And uh, they're using now, you know, they want to use the union uh, or use our contract as a scapegoat for a reason to gouge the consumer even more. And that doesn't have to happen. So, you know, we're going to be watching that and we're going to call it what it is. It's corporate greed. How much did the administration have to do with this deal getting done? You know, we were always in contact. I mean, obviously, when I was elected president just seven short months ago, you know, we had a lot of concerns. The EV battery industry was uh, it was on track to be, you know, a, a race to the bottom. Uh, you know, the Altium plant in Lordstown, Ohio, was starting workers at sixteen fifty an hour and taking seven years to get to twenty dollars an hour. Those are poverty wages. Uh, those workers are working with dangerous chemicals uh, that aren't even regulated by OSHA yet. Um, you know, and so it's it's hard work. Um, and so. You know, it was imperative that we get control of that. And, and I do believe, you know, the White House, you know, when they uh, came up with the IRA the, uh, funding and stuff for the transition, their intentions were good with, you know, saying they wanted these to be union jobs. But unfortunately, when you give these companies an inch, they take a mile. And, uh, you know, the companies were fine with it being union jobs as long as they were low paying union jobs. So we we wanted to get to where we set the standard and we get a good labor standard put in place. And we were able to do that in this round of bargaining. And so. You know, Secretary Treasure. Uh, I'm sorry, Secretary of Labor Julie Su, uh, you know, Trade Ambassador Catherine Tai, Gene Sperling. I mean, we had a lot of support um, from their team, and uh, of course the president. And uh, obviously, you know, we saw the president visit a picket line for the first time, and uh, and obviously there was money, you know, on the table uh, to to try to revive uh, dying communities and uh, you know close plants, and that's how we were able to for the first time to bring back a plant that was written off for dead, and not just get one plant, but get two plants. So. You know, that's what happens when we all work together for the will, benefit of working class people. Will the UAW endorse President Biden? Um, you know, we're, we're going to make endorsements when that time is right. Uh, you know, r literally right now, our, our focus is 100 percent on getting the contracts to the membership, getting the information to the membership and, and, and getting agreements ratified. And then we move on to the next phase of organizing. And uh, we have a process we follow uh, when it comes to endorsements, and we'll follow that process, and uh, we'll make endorsements when, when, when we feel the time is right. Sean Fain, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. The U.S. says Israel has agreed to daily four-hour pauses in fighting in parts of northern Gaza. The goal is to give people time to safely move further south. Israel is making it clear there will be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. Meanwhile, there are no pauses in hate anywhere, including right here in the United States. All of these headlines on your screen are just from the last week. So let's discuss. I want to bring in Rabbi Mark Schneier, president of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, and Imam Shamsi Ali, spiritual leader of the Jamaica Muslim Center, both together are trying to combat the rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on college campuses. I thank you both for being here. I just need to start. Rabbi, what has this last month been like for you? How are you? It's been very challenging, but I believe the Imam and I have prepared 20 years for this moment. Wait, the two of you have been together for 20 years. 20 How? Years. How do you know each other? We <laughs> met when John Paul II had passed away. And there was a very prominent other network uh, here in New York that did a special segment on the Pope's relationship with the other Abrahamic traditions. Shamsi represented the Muslim religion. I represented the Jewish community at the time. We barely looked at each other. I was probably not as courteous as he was at the time. And from that moment on, we planted the seeds and we became great friends and collaborators leading the charge of building Muslim Jewish relations not only here in New York, but globally. Wow. Yes. But now here we are. That's right. So I guess you've been prepared for this moment. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I'd never be prepared for this moment. I prepare for a better world. And that's why we began our journey, a journey of friendship, a journey of partnership for common good. So what are you doing together and, now? Um, if you ask me for what we have done in the last 20 years, we have done quite a lot. Um, I used to say that we both of us seeing the promised land and we are challenged to get into that promised land. What I mean promised land is a peace. Um, 
um, the question is how to get into that promised land. And we challenge ourselves to find that way. And I think to such an extent we found that way that we, we, we have the way to, to come together. Uh, one of the, the way to come together is realizing that we Jews and Muslims do not only have a common faith, but in fact we have a common faith, destiny. And the most, either you like it or not, the most two identical religions in the world are Judaism and Islam. And more importantly, um, for me as an imam and I think for the rabbi as well, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is just the two sides of the same coin. You know, it's two terms with the same essence. We were called into action last week. Tell me how. We met first with 30 Jewish student leaders from different Hillels through CUNY, really through Chancellor Rodriguez. Hillels, the, the, on college campuses, the, right. the Jewish groups on college campuses. Correct, the, student, the Jewish student unions, and they represented some six CUNY campuses. They met with me, they met with the Imam, they were absolutely overwhelmed to with have what? the opportunity to meet with the Imam to express their fears their concerns, their anxieties with the rise of anti-Semitism on college campus. And then last week, we then met with the heads of the Muslim Student Association at Lehman College in the Bronx. It was very, very intense, very emotionally charged, very passionate. But we delivered a very simple message. Cherish freedoms, protest, demonstrate. Do not cross the line no violence, no intimidation, no confrontation. We can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. You planted the seeds of forgiveness and togetherness, but are the seeds of this hate rising coming from misinformation? These are young people. Where are they getting the messages from? Where is this hate coming from? I think we are in the, in the very open uh, information at the moment particularly the, uh, the, uh, the media that is unregulated. I mean, you know. Social media. Social yes. media, what I mean. And so many of our youngsters are being victimized by this. Uh, they don't realize that actually both of us, Jews and Muslims, are victimized by the, both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And I consider this a common threat for both of us. And the threat that we Muslims are facing, Islamophobia, it, it's not coming from the Jewish people. Vice versa, the threat to the Jewish people is not coming from the Muslims. The person who killed the boy in Chicago is not a Jew people, it's not a Jewish. So I think we must challenge ourselves to build these relations with Jews and Muslims because we are really on the same board. We have even more commonality. As the rabbi say, we can disagree, we can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. I tend to be very practical. There's a rise in anti-Semitism. Why? And why is there rise in yes. anti-Semitism? Like, where because is this hate the, coming the, the from? The whole conflict is just simply misunderstood. The fact that, I, I'll tell you one thing that was somewhat refreshing to me when I met with the Muslim Students Association, I would invoke the name Hamas, the term Hamas, and they would say, Rabbi, Rabbi, we're not supporters of Hamas. They broke out Hamas from the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict because Hamas does not represent the aspirations of the Palestinian people. Look at the Article 7, the Charter of Hamas. It's only to destroy Israel, it's to destroy the Jewish people, it's to destroy Christianity, it's to destroy Western democracy. But Hamas made a fateful mistake on October 7th. You see, they thought they were targeting defenseless and harmless Jews. In 2023, unlike 85 years ago tonight, Kristallnacht, when every synagogue in Germany and Austria was destroyed, and we did not hear world leaders, we did not hear their voices raised in screaming protests. It was a moral laryngitis. It was a deafening silence. Today, Jews are no longer helpless. They're no longer defenseless. At the same time, we must turn to great American Muslim leaders. You know, this isn't right. just some imam, the fact mm -hmm. that he's also my, 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 my dear brother. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're sitting here with the imam, the most prominent imam, the largest mosque in all of New York. 
And I can tell you that when Trump was president and he legislated the anti-Muslim ban, who were the great champions? For the Muslim community, it was the Jewish community. Well, you know what? Today, we need American Muslim leaders to protect and to defend Jews, Jewish students on college and that's campuses. our commitment. That is our commitment that, for me, anti-Semitism is my fight, as he have taken Islam for his fight. You know, we advance our common humanity, that despite of the existence dif uh, differences that we have, we have even more in common. And at the end of the day, we are all human beings. We deserve dignity, we deserve respect, we deserve peace, reconciliation. And I think this world is shared by each and every one of us. We need just to live peacefully. And that's our uh, aspiration, that's our dream as human beings. We've been asked to visit every CUNY campus from these one borough in New York City over the next three weeks. And this is the message that we are going to convey. We have the history, we have the experience. Again, protest, love. demonstrate the love, protest, yes. demonstrate, do what, 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 whatever you want to do. Yeah, we but there is a line you do not cross. We cherish our freedom to express our opinion, to express our you know, uh, agreement and disagreement. But don't go beyond, beyond the lines. I am so grateful for the work you are doing together across these college campuses. It is what we need.